Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Thank you for coming to this talk. I'm Stephen Sia. I'm from the Diocese of Singapore, but I'm now uh, serving the Diocese as the Dean of Cambodia. I live in Cambodia. I've been living in Cambodia or in Phnom Penh for the last almost three years, two and a half two years. So I got involved in this work actually 10 years ago in 2009 when two of my members wanted to serve as English teachers in Cambodia. And back then, I didn't know what, we would, what the diocese was doing in Cambodia. So because I have two members who wanted to go to Cambodia to serve as teachers, I asked a lot of questions. So that's a bad thing to do. Because when you ask a lot of questions, people give you responsibility. So they make me the support coordinator and became that. And I got involved in that work. So over the years, the, well, the next five, ten years, uh, eight years or so, I would visit Cambodia three to five times a year. Each time could be ranging between four days to eight days or ten days. So that was, that was my, 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 my link with that. But then I found that uh, doing that was not good enough. We were trying to run Cambodia via email, via distance, via phone call. And I could see that things were not moving. And then three years ago, oh, that's more than three years ago, it's about four years ago, I was teaching the epistles of Paul. Then I found out to my horror that Paul was not only a very strong theologian, he was not only a, 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 a very good missionary, was, was a great church planter, but Paul was very pastoral at heart. Then I thought about it, ah, that's what I'm teaching, right? And then the word spoke to me. Then I said, God, yeah, I... I no, it, it wasn't this. It was like, yes, I need to be on the ground with the brothers. What they need is a shepherd on the field to, to guide them, to help them, to hold their hands. And then for that reason, actually, I offered myself to Bishop. I said, Bishop, if you want, I'm happy to go down to the field. I'm willing to stay there a long time with my wife. Okay, I said that before asking her. So, that's, that's, so if you're into process, that's not quite right. <laughs> But God, God's hand was over us. Uh, he had prepared in advance, so my wife was willing to go with me. But I told Bishop, if you want to send me to Cambodia, please don't send me there for three years. Because by the time I learned the language, and by the time I built relationship with the people, I have to leave, so it would be very difficult. So the offer was actually to serve there until my retirement, which is in another 11 years or 12 years' time. So, yeah, I said either, you know, until I retire, until the work is done, and I can guarantee you the work will be done. <laughs> anyway, before we start, let's go to the God in prayer. Praise you, huh? okay. Praise you, Lord. Yeah. So, Father, we thank you for your love for Cambodia. We thank you for all that you have been doing in this country. We thank you for the opportunities that the Anglican Church uh, is, uh, has to serve you in Cambodia. We thank you for bringing us together this afternoon. Father, we just pray that you be present and then, Lord, you just speak to each one of us in the way that you want. We, say, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the country. So when you think about Cambodia, everyone thinks about Khmer Rouge, but that's 1975 to 1978. But what you may not know is after the, that, that, that Pol Pot period, actually the country was not stable. So there was civil war and then there was at least a period of 10 to 11 years where the Vietnamese government came over and they governed the country and of course that was not a pleasant time it was 1991 I think it was October or something the Paris Peace Accord was signed and it took a bit of time in 1993 Kin Siano, well, agreed to let the churches come in please come and build your churches and the Anglican Church was one of them the Archbishop of Canterbury received the invitation and said Singapore I think you're near to Cambodia, would you be interested in going there? And of course, our bishop then, our diocesan bishop said yes. So that's how we landed in Cambodia. Last year, we celebrated our 25th anniversary. So we've been in Cambodia for 25 years. But after 1993, you can still hear gunshots in the city. It was not safe. People will rob you and kill you for your watch or your motorbike and so on and so forth. But those period, those those difficulties are behind us. When I reached Cambodia, they were, I, I, I had no fear of those things. But the country was unstable, but the economy was growing. So over the last five years, the GDP in that country grew uh, between 7 to 7.5%. Yeah. Okay, so they may start from a low base, but at least they are in the right trajectory. And if you've been to Cambodia in, like five years ago and you go there now, you can see a huge difference in the city of Phnom Penh. While high scrapers are coming up everywhere, 
then you can see the traffic, all the cars. Can you, do you recognize it? Can you imagine seeing a Rolls Royce in the city of Phnom Penh? I'm told, I'm told that there is a Rolls Royce service center in Phnom Penh. And that Rolls Royce would not set up a service center unless there's a hundred Rolls Royces in, in that country. So that's how, well, some of the rich people are there. The top maybe two, three percent, I think eight families or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny, narrow street crowded and then this Rolls Royce driven by an old man or a lady. But that's the, the situation. So although economically they are growing, they're improving, that the, the, the economy is not well diversified. Really, the, the, the money is coming in because the Chinese have been, as in mainland Chinese, they've been investing a lot of money doing construction. So all the city, all the money is coming in is in construction. And then it's somehow... It's like a one bill, one room initiative. Uh, not quite, uh, not quite. But, but you know China is buying favour from everybody, right? Yeah. By investing in the country. So this is not the one belt, one road thing. Anyway, Chinese, the Chinese are everywhere. Yeah. yeah, okay. So anyway, they're there, they pump a lot of money. It's basically construction, and it's basically looking for Chinese buyers. I mean, very few people can afford. But I, will, I attended a World Bank talk at the beginning of this year, and then the person said, well, wages in the public sector has increased. In the public sector, I'm like waiting for the next slide. So in the private sector, what is the situation? There was no slight on the private sector. So the public sector was getting money and they were probably the ones who are buying all these cars that are coming onto the street. So that is, there is economic development. But despite this so-called prospect, uh, you see this economic improvement and so on and so forth, there are actually many basic needs in the society that still have not been met. So public education for the longest time was very weak. The teachers hardly turn up for class. They take money from the students so that the students get tuition from them or get to sit for exams or get the answers to the exam. So that's how bad the system is. So you can have a student that is in grade 9 or whatever and you compare that student to with a grade 6 student from Singapore, that the Cambodian child is probably going to be a lot weaker. There are many things they, they don't know. So they go through school without really learning. That's the problem. The situation has improved. They've taken, they have improved the teacher's salary a little bit. So we're seeing some small improvement. But because of this problem, a lot of NGOs have already been going in to teach, to, to, to provide education at a private level or a free level. So the church has been doing that. And we do that also. So that's just an indication of basic needs not being met. Water, clean water, public health, still very poor. Still very poor, even though there's been improvement over the last few years. Okay, I talk about this, all this in increasing uh, economic well-being, right? So you see a rise actually in the pursuit of materialism. So I'm showing you two pictures. This is the left. On the right is Brown Coffee, a local franchisee. When I was there 10 years ago, when you go to a coffee shop, 90% would be expect customers. Now you go to these coffee shops, 95% that would be Cambodians and Cambodian young people. They have the money, I, I think from the parents, to fill up the, the coffee shops. So on the right is Aeon Mall, which is a popular mall, and you see that actually people are going there, shopping, buying luxury stuff, and so on and so forth. But the thing is that there is a pursuit for materialism. People are, they would prefer an iPhone, a Samsung, to a Huawei, or, or, or Opel, or what have you, you know. And they're always looking for the next model of motorcycle. They're looking to hope to buy a house for themselves. So there is this pursuit of materialism. Please don't judge them because Singapore went through the same thing. So it's just part of this whole cycle as the country goes through economic uh, improvement. The people as a whole hope to catch, ride that thing and then get, get uh, more comfortable materially. So the pursuit of materialism. But I, I put that weak morals, but that's been a problem for them for the longest time. So you got to realize they went through hell, right, with the, during the Khmer Rouge era. So that time it was all about survival. Ch the, 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 the children were betraying the parents, the parents were betraying, nobody trusted anybody. And then even within Khmer Rouge, everybody was, well, lying about everybody. So distrust is a very huge problem. And as a result of that, you've, I found that the Cambodians have very weak morals. They, they're not really interested in all this high thing. So they have no qualms about lying. They have no qualms about stealing. They have no qualms. Actually, they just, they're, they're just concerned about their own interests or the interests of their immediate family. 
they don't care about others so you see that when they ride their motor on the streets very inconsiderate so you will find that these are all the and of course the clearest manifestation is corruption in the country uh, generally so rich but struggling with so this is where there is a cry out right there is a void there is something that needs to be filled up what they lack is actually a king and the king's value so this is where the church comes in and this is where Christ comes in okay I want to show you this statistic it's taken from uh, 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 well a blog called MK2021 this is dated statistic okay this is 2017 the population now is not 13 or at least assuming that's 2008 because it's now 16.5 million or thereabouts huh? so this is quite dated and look at the score, the amount of the percentage of Christians, 1.3, 1.2. Some surveys say it's 5%, but I am like, what's the difference between 2% and 5%? The key point or the takeaway is that 95% has still not heard the gospel, has still not been saved. Sorry. Is that just Protestants or including Catholics? Yeah. This one, uh, Protestant. Just Protestant, yeah. But Catholics are not very strong there. They are like they have a congregation of three hundred people, I think, in Phnom Penh. I'm not sure if they are they are elsewhere. Three hundred. I have not met the Orthodox Church. Okay, so but I'm not sure if this figure covers the Orthodox Church. Yeah, but the Mormons are there. The Seventh Day Adventists are there. Okay, so anyway, but the point I want to tell you is it doesn't matter whether it's two percent, it's five percent. The key thing is. So many people still have not accepted Jesus. That's that's the real takeaway. There is a lot to be done huh, for the gospel. Okay. So let me see. I'm already there. Twenty five percent. Okay. So I want to say something about those figures. Okay. In in, in in Cambodia, there are many so called pastors, but their pastors are not like the ones we know. These pastors, they, they just. I believe in Jesus, I care about, I, you know, I want to share the faith. So they'll try and convert their family members. And if their family members accept Christ, there you have, you have a house church. Then the pastor is hardly trained. Like 90% of the pastor, their training is, they go and attend a three-day course here and there, you know, during the course of a year, maybe attend two or three courses. They don't have systematic training. Like workshop is their main diet. And if you are in the rural area in the past, the signal is actually very bad. You can't even go online. I remember going there and trying to find out the, what's the soccer results of <laughs> EPL. It's like, oh man, it's on, I'm waiting. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll find out when I get back to Singapore. So it's that bad. Anyway, it's improved, but it's still not so good. But at least there's some uh, internet access. Huh? But the pastors there are untrained. They are actually under-resourced. They have hardly anything. And they are underpaid. Many of them actually survived on $50 or less. So poverty line is about a dollar US a day. About So he's $50. And many of them struggle to look after their families. Okay, And most of them are bivocational because you've got to realize that 85% or thereabouts of the country is rural, agricultural. So that's up there. Okay. So th that's the situation with, with the pastor. So I'm thinking, well, if you want a strong church, you need to have a strong pastor. So maybe one, one thing we really need to look into as part of the Anglican Church is to look into the training of these pastors. So one idea I have is actually to come alongside these pastors. I'm thinking like that there are 25 provinces, we are in four provinces, there are like 21 provinces where we are not, we have no presence. I just, please tell me who is good. One year I take on three or four, and then within five years I'll have 20, right? And if we train them, with no string attached, it's not like, you know, you need to be an Anglican before we'll give you the support. Uh, we just want to come alongside, be a spiritual friend, we'll give you resources, we'll give you lesson plans, we'll give you an uh, audio Bible, I'll give you a Kermai commentary, a Kermai dictionary if you can handle that. Because many of them can barely read as well. But if you need an audio Bible, I'll give you an audio Bible. You need song sheets, I'll give you song books, things like that. To resource the pastor in order for them to minister. And whenever we hold training in the city, we can invite them to join the training. We pay for the transport, we pay for the lodging. We give them a little love gift so that they have some income. So when they go back, they don't suffer from, well, whatever loss of income they may have. So that's, that's one key area. Okay, now the next slide. 
So the last 25 years we've been sewing. Oh, the slides are all in different order. Okay, if you look at this, I'll talk about the, this, this skill training uh, project. This is one of our best work in Cambodia. This project was started about 12 years ago by the cathedral in Singapore. That's St. Andrew's Cathedral. This work is single-handedly actually uh, uh, supported by cathedral alone. They do a wonderful job. Every year we train maybe close to 100 kids or a different number, between 80 to 100 kids to, to for what train them over a two-year program to be able to work in the food uh, and beverage industry. So we have a great sister. She used to be the chief air steward of Singapore Airlines and she's been providing that training for 10 years. Although her initial commitment was, I'll just serve here for one year. <laughs> so she's stayed there for the, the last 10 years. So when you look at the baptism rate that we get from this, this, this institution, we get between like 50 to 80 baptism a year. That's how good it is. And then because our students are so well trained, a lot of the hotels today, and there are many sprouting up because of the Chinese, they are asking, hey, do you have students for us this year? Do you have students for us this year? And I tell you, Susan doesn't just train these kids. First year is English learning. And after that first year, less than half of them make it to the next year to go to food and beverage because their English is so bad. You've you got to realize they know very little. The other half with very little English, they will be trained to do housekeeping, you know. Sweet Noah, learn a bit of maintenance skill. So that's what it is. But Susan would go with them for interviews with the hotel. She would drive the van, take them to Simrip, take them to, to Prevet, take them to Popet, Sihano, and uh, accompany them for their interview. They would be properly dressed, they would be trained to do interviews, and because of her hard work over the last 12 years, and our students have done well, they built a reputation for our standards. And, and many of them actually are, 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 are grateful for this ministry. Their lives have been changed. So this is the training institution. Okay, Language center. So English was in great demand and still in great demand today because with English you can, you can look for a better job, have a better income. So we've been trying to run English and we haven't been very successful. But now we have something. We have two learning centers. One in the province, Prehood. That, that learning center, which we started only at the end of last year, until, not last year, yeah, oh no, no, end of the year before, we have 200 students coming in. So they come, they go for their normal class, they come for classes either before school or after school. We have four Cambodian teachers supported by one Singaporean uh, supervisor or principal or superintendent. Then we have one learning center in the suburb of Phnom Penh, it's in a place called Tak Mau. And that's where we, we run maybe 20 or 30 kids, okay, with two teachers and a Singaporean supervisor who is my wife. Okay, so we are running that work in the suburb. And then now with Becky, Becky, can you just put up your hand so people can see? Uh, Becky joined us in March. She comes through AFM and Becky is helping us to teach English. She was an English teacher in the States and God spoke to her last year and things moved very, or two years ago, Things move so quickly, and Becky is now with us teaching English to young adults with some English. So she's helping, and the program she's using is called Spotlight. And the good thing about Spotlight is they talk about, well, different topics, Ravi Shankar, new things. So the people are not just learning English, the students are not just learning English, they are also learning about the world around them, opening up their, their, their mind. So there is, we, we will need more English teachers. So there is a church called uh, New Life Fellowship. For the longest time, they have been running English classes with the help of Americans who come and teach on a part-time basis. And they have trained hundreds and hundreds of Cambodians. And you know what is their requirement? Every two Sundays of the month, you must come for Sunday service. Because we want you to practice your English with it. All the <laughs> and you know what? They got a high conversion rate. And some of the people I meet uh, from New Life who's, who've gone through that English and left the place and they are committed to Jesus and they are looking at ways where they can serve. So one of them has started at, at three schools in the slum, which is amazing. Local, local guy doing it all by himself and his wife, wonderful. So that, that's where the English is important. Okay, next one. So we have worship center. On the right, you see our international congregation. 
but now maybe about 200 strong. During summer, people leave, they will drop to maybe 150, but otherwise, average about 200. Our priest is from America, from the Church of Resurrection, Britain, Illinois. Okay. Then in the middle, you see this young man, he's Jesse. Jesse is from uh, the Church of Restoration, and uh, yeah, and he looks after our Kermai service. He's such a gift to us because he speaks Kermai and he preaches in Kermai. And because he's young and playful and all that, he's ideal for our work with the Cambodian young people. You know, when I arrived in Phnom Penh, our Kermai service was struggling. In the past, we had maybe 40 to 50 people. We, when I arrived, there was like 20 or 25 of us, out of which 15 were my staff and their family members. Then I'm like, I'm paid, I'm, I have Jesse, I have four staff, I'm paying so much money for four people on Sunday or five people on Sunday. But anyway, Jesse turned it around. Now we have like 60 to 70 people every every Sunday. Yeah. So the Kamai congregation is going. Oh, well, that's a, the other picture. They just have me there and to show you that I'm a working. Huh? Is the worship only in English or is it translated? Oh, okay. This is English. This is in Kamai. Actually, I, we also have a Chinese-speaking church in another location. But uh, next week or next Sunday or two Sundays after this, we'll start a Chinese-speaking church in our main uh, service in our main church. Which one has more attendance? The English, oh, the English has more attendance. Yeah. The English. Oh, sorry. What is the posture of the government towards religious things? Are oh, they Cambodia. Oh, they are really open about it. They welcome the churches, the NGO. You got to remember, in 1993, they had nothing. NGO, please come in. You can do the things. You can supply the services that we are not able to supply. So you know, education, health, what have you, wells and clean water. So they welcome a lot of NGOs. But now they are starting to control the NGOs. So Cambodia is is, is good. It's open. We are at. I, I very little threat of being uh, chased away, as long as we stay away from politics and the prime minister's election. Okay, so those, those but it's an open country. Okay. I, I I move on. Ooh, okay, I'm on. Dom Ministry. Okay, Dom Ministry. We're doing very well with the Dom Ministry, and. Uh, the dorm ministry is, is, is a, an important channel to be able to, to, to reach out to the young people because we have time with them. They stay with us. They go through some Christian program and so on and so forth. So they get exposed. Oh, I love this. I want to tell this story because Mark and this comes from Ireland. All the way from Ireland. I came, we have this center and we were not using it uh, for the longest time. When they came, they told me they wanted to run a daycare center for vulnerable children under four years old. I love it. I say, please, you do this. I'm happy to spur up the place for you. We'll supply the place and so on and so forth. You run the program. And they run these children. They, okay. So when they, they, they receive these kids, the mother gets to go to work. The grandmother that was looking after the child gets to go to work. And then we, we, have, we see people coming to Christ because of that. And this lady who was bilingual, as they speak Khmer in English, she looked at Mark and Liz, and last December she gave her life to Wow, that's wonderful. Okay, so this is a really good piece of work. But I say this because if there's anyone among you who are thinking of doing something in Cambodia and we can work with you, I'm happy to collaborate with you. Okay, that's the main point. Okay, rural ministry. We have a lot of rural ministry. Okay, let me see. Uh, okay. We've been doing 25 years, but we haven't been very good at making disciples. Because we do a lot of activities. We run annual camps, annual VPS, annual rallies. We do a lot of things, and we're very focused on activities. You look at Singaporean, you can see why. We're strong on activities. And although we preach the gospel, we're not very good in disciple making. So I want to focus, I want us to focus not just on the activity, not just spending those few days doing those things. I want us to focus on making sure people actually receive and accept the gospel. So we have to move from event, like running event, to try to build relationship. We need to think about not just 
doing the occasional two, three times a year trip, but to do it more regularly on a monthly basis. We're going to move away from, well, speaking in a rally to 500 people, 2,000 people. Because when I go there, I preach badly. I say, who wants to go to heaven? 100% everybody puts up their hand. It has nothing to do with my preaching, you know. So that's the situation. With so I want to move away from the crowd. And I want us to move to the few who are desirous of learning the God, knowing Jesus Christ, and then being able to mentor them. Move away from gifts. Because people come for our gifts. They don't come for the giver. To God. So we want to, instead of offer gifts, let's offer prayer, scripture, <coughs> spiritual friendship. Okay? Then move the gospel, proclamation of the gospel from preacher to members. So it's not just the Singaporean that's preaching, but every member in the church, Cambodian member, Chinese. So this is the, the, the point. Yeah? So let me move from there. So we are tasked, we're very tasked people, you know. I want to move away from task to more. I put the word training, which is bad. Actually, I'm thinking of building capacity. So instead of instructional, more mentoring. Instead of doing things ourselves because we want to do things well, we want to do things quickly, we can't wait for the Cambodians to learn to do it, we do it for them. Instead of helping them to do it for themselves, we want to move to Cambodian. We are result-based, so we need to work, be less concerned about outcome. How many people came? Was, was the food well done? You know, what, were the presents adequate? You know, that kind of issue. But instead of moving fast, we like to move, we have to move slower. And instead of taking the easier route, we have to walk the harder route. Yeah. So that's the situation. What are the opportunities? And of course, e English, teaching English is the lowest fruit. I think many of you can come. So Becky has been teaching English. So she's, she's getting to know. But Becky is also making friends with other people, other expats living there. So she knows a lady who used to be a Christian but has moved away, this Canadian lady from the, the language school. So she, you know, she's trying to make friends and trying to get her to come back. You know? And then she also was making friends with a Chinese lady called Piho. Oh, yeah. Am I out of time? Almost out of time. Almost. Almost. I'm so sorry. <laughs> There'll be no more questions. <laughs> I'm looking for a social worker because there are a lot of poor and needy around us. And so far we've been giving money, but that's not good enough. I want someone to help me figure out what we should be doing, train a team of people, and then develop the processes so we can do it well. Business or social enterprise. Many of our young people in Swairin, in, in Posad, they come to Christ, but when they reach 15, 16, 17, 18, the family say, no, you have to go out and work. So they leave the church, they work somewhere else, and before that, we, we would lose them to the world. So we want to be able to start some businesses where we can then hire these people. Okay, this is about resource and anyway the app. This is something else. If you can write an app, it, it, oh, it's something else. Okay, this is where you can contact them. Okay, I'm going to end here. I'm so sorry. There was so much to share. I need to go already. Right? Yeah, if you have questions, we can go next door. Or can I just take one or two questions? Yes. It seems like from my Absolutely. Do you have any vision for like starting a seminary or other forms of... I have no vision to start a seminary. <laughs> <laughs> because the Cambodians are very poorly educated, many of them cannot make that kind of level of training. But I'm keen to s start something that I can give them at this level. And it may well be after five years, ten years, where the, the whole country as a whole is different, then maybe we'll start a seminary. I'm not close to it, but I'm not planning to start it. Okay. Any? Yes. Okay. Last. This is the last one. Eh? So short-term teams have been helpful and hurtful. So it depends. Yeah. So if you come, you must come with a posture to be willing to do whatever is necessary and whatever is needed in order to help us. So I had two girls from Singapore, which was a blessing to us when they came to help us with our English centre. I have two adults who came and they were more trouble than it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the situation. Thank you, sorry. Uh, the Dean is telling me I'm out of time. We'll have to go. All right, if you have some more questions, we'll just move over to the room next door and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you.